All right, looks good to go. Welcome everyone. My name is Evan. Uh, welcome to Stoplight 101. If you're familiar with our product, this is a great place to, place to start. If you're not familiar with our product, uh, this is also a great place to start. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Troy. I just want to give a brief introduction on who we are. Uh, my name is Evan Lee. I'm a sales development rep here at Stoplight, and I'm here with Troy Miller. He's our solutions consultant. He's going to be walking you through the demo today. Let me give you a little bit of an overview of what we'll be doing today. So I want to get through a couple of housekeeping items first. Um, this demo is scheduled to last 30 minutes long. We're also going to have time for 15 minutes of Q&A. So if you've used Zoom before for a webinar, you'll be familiar with that how that works. But if you're not, you can go down to the bottom part of your screen, go to Q&A and submit your questions there throughout the whole demo, and then we'll answer them at the end in 15 minutes. If you can't make it for any reason, you have to drop off mid-demo. Um, we'll also be recording this, this webinar so that you can see it act after, and we'll send that to you uh, within the next week. Awesome. And then just for the demo overview, Troy will be going over a lot of the cool stuff you can do on our platform. If it's been a while since you've kept up with us, a lot of stuff has changed. So I'm excited for you guys to see what we have in store for you. All right, so who is Stoplight? Well, we were founded about seven years ago by our founder, Mark, a uh, huge dev advocate. We have a lot of open source projects and we're based out of Austin, Texas. Now our goal is to unlock design first practices so you can minimize future costs speed up time to market, and create more consistent microservice and IoT applications. That's why our best-in-class platform is the first to take a design-driven approach at every stage of API development, creating efficiency and standardization at scale. Now, I'm going to leave it off to Troy. He is going to go through a full demo with you and show you exactly what makes our platform so special for API development. Hey, everyone. Thanks very much, Evan. Before I dive into the product, uh, I do want to give a short shout out to uh, this slide, which is a design first versus code first comparison. And I always enjoy this slide because uh, it's almost counterintuitive, right? The design first approach at the top there looks a lot longer. Um, it seems like it involves a lot more people than the code first approach, which is the kind of just get it done approach that uh, we're probably all very familiar with. But I think what's not necessarily expressed here is um, how you save time overall by taking the design first approach, how the cost of iteration is significantly less when you're only at the API contract stage of development as opposed to implementation. And so at the top there, um, you can see that at every step of the way, there's feedback that can come from any number of players uh, to restart the process, not necessarily from scratch, but build upon what's already been created. All right, let's go ahead and dive into the demo here. I have up here the workspace uh, called API Guild. A workspace in Stoplight is essentially what you would use for your organization. It's your main hub in Stoplight. And within a workspace, you're going to have these projects, not specifically these projects, but you'll have it projects that in turn are linked to your version control system and is a container for all of your uh, open API files, uh, shared JSON schema models, style guides, um, you know, human generated markdown files for documentation. Uh, all of those things are going to be contained within a project. You can search across all of your projects very quickly and easily. Like I said, this is an external logged out view, so anyone uh, can go to apiguild.stoplot.io right now and start searching through uh, what we have here. For example, one of the things that we could search for is uh, devices. Uh, we have an API with some models and some markdown files that talks about devices. And you can see here that it's pointing us to these APIs. Um, it's in the Project Cloud Home. It has these various endpoints and verbs associated with them. And you can very quickly find what you're looking for just by searching up at the very top. When I dive into a specific project, uh, 
I'm presented with this view, which is very familiar to anyone who's seen any other API documentation tools. Uh, we mix what is markdown, human generated markdown, like the page you see here, uh, which is simply you know, common syntax markdown, very straightforward stuff uh, with a few added things such as this interactive documentation, uh, these blurbs, which we like to call stoplight syntax. Uh, all of these are backwards compatible though. So if you wanna take this markdown that you've created here for stoplight and show it somewhere else, you can go ahead and do that as well. Beyond the human generated markdown, you also have um, documentation that's created by your open API file. And really Stoplight has two components. One is documentation and discoverability. And that's what this is about. When you're logged in, you have access to a few more tools that I'll show you uh, when it comes to that as well. And this is all about producing documentation that can be used by your clients or internally um, and sharing your open API file. The other half of Stoplight is all about authorship, generating that open API file, ensuring the collaborators that are also working on that open API file or generating uh, shared models, that there's a common style guide and some amount of governance over those APIs. If you were to dive into a specific API endpoint, um, you'll see that it's very clear. The documentation that we produce is simple. Um, you can add additional markdown and descriptions here, and we advise you to do so, so that your documentation can be robust. But then it goes through and describes all the things from your open API file, uh, parameters, response bodies, uh, examples, so on and so forth. In addition, the try it out mechanism is right up here as well. Um, this is where you would typically go to create a request that would hit your API. But since we take a design first approach, we also support something called mocking. And this is a really neat uh, change to what you would typically find in other try it out mechanisms. This allows you to take your open API file and produce results for consumers of your API um, that are dynamic uh, and that they can use to test out in their client code. So here I've, I've enabled mocking. I can go ahead and set the response generation to dynamic. Add my simple account ID and API key that I've prescribed and then send a request. In this case, I'm getting back an array of objects. And this is really helpful because this allows you to identify, uh, you know, as a client side programmer or as let's say a QA engineer, or even a product manager to make sure that the data that you've described is how you would expect it to be consumed. You know, some perhaps maybe you're, you haven't accounted for Boolean here or quite as many decimal places here, or you didn't think something would be a string or nullable or it'd have to be more characters than it otherwise would. Mocking is a really great, great way of getting feedback from your collaboration, from your organization so that you can build the right thing. In addition, uh, you can even take that uh, mock server and you can insert it into uh, your markdown files so for example that mock is provided by prism 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 is an open source tool and with prism you can generate a server to produce those mocks uh, and even per perhaps even create a stand up a proxy so that it can intercept incoming requests and outgoing responses and make sure that those fit the mocks as well in this case, we've took, taken that mock endpoint and enabled anyone to hit that request. You can see here that you can go ahead and change what responses you get. So if instead of a 200, we want to simulate a 400 response, I can just change the prefer header here and get that back. Let me show you a little bit about the settings that we support once you've signed in. When I go to sign in, you can see all of the SSO options that we have available. Um, there's actually even more than this. Uh, we support also LDAP. Uh, we use GitHub here at Stoplight, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, sign in with that. And once I'm signed in, you can see that the things I have access to uh, expands. Each of these projects, uh, before I could only see the ones that were public. 
Now I can see those that are listed as private or even those that are listed as internal. The difference here being that those that are internal, anyone in your internal organization can access. Those that are private, only the owner can access those unless they give explicit access out. This explore feature is also something only available to internal users and is a really good way for API product managers or architects to get a good at a glance view of the API uh, as a whole and all of the assets your organization has generated around your API. So once again, if I wanna search here for something like devices, I can quickly find uh, all of the markdown files, open API files, or even specific endpoints and models that reference devices. I can further drill down, see a preview of the documentation that my organization has created access the try it out functionality once more, even access just the mock server. And I can copy and paste and share this with anyone else in the organization because this is always running. I can even view dependencies. So in this case, uh, I'm looking at a list devices endpoint. This graph is meant to show you that it has relationships with a device model, with response status models, and, uh, and then in turn, that these models also uh, have downstream dependencies with new device API endpoints, update device, et cetera. This is really helpful for when you wanna change an endpoint or a model, you can see what kind of downstream impacts that could potentially have. This also gives you access to the change log. Change log here is really helpful uh, for once again, just seeing, keeping up to speed with the kinds of changes that have taken place, uh, how, significant those changes were, whether they were a patch, a minor, or a major. This is something that Stoplight uh, automatically produces based off of the activity in your Git repository. I'm gonna show you around a couple of the settings real quick that you can uh, modify once you're in the, a workspace. You can customize it um, by producing, by creating uh, new images or new themes that match your brand. You can even point this to a custom domain. Now it's probably worth pointing out here that some of the features that I'm showing you today are features for pro or enterprise plans, um, but you have access to all of the uh, core functionality with, uh, with a simple starter or trial plan as well. The projects tab also gives you a good at a glance view of all the projects in your organization. You can very quickly see how big they are and what kind of visibility they have. You can control access uh, and we have various levels of control so that depending on your organization, you can decide whether you wanna make everyone makers, viewers, owners, or guests as you see fit. You can even whitelist an entire email domain to give uh, your partners ready access. We've talked about the integrations tab uh, insofar as this is where you would configure your SSO options. And the automations tab uh, talks about, is really shows you all the activity that happens uh, with the web hooks that are configured, automatically configured when you set up your project. The idea being that you can edit your open API files or your model schemas, even outside of Stoplight. And when they get pushed into uh, the Stoplight tracked repository, then your documentation will automatically be updated to reflect those changes. So let's go into the authorship tool by clicking edit in studio. Once you're here, uh, it'll remember where you last were. In this case, I was doing manual edits of the code of my open API file called devices.v1.yaml. But I can very quickly and easily switch to a form field edit mode uh, where I can define my verbs, enter more markdown, and start specifying all of the headers, the query parameters, request and response bodies that I need. And as I make changes, the documentation will update as well. And it updates fast. I can go ahead and mark something as deprecated, uh, although this doesn't actually have any impact on your API specifically, but it does call it out very 
explicitly in your documentation. Of course, when you do that, it's good to update your description to make it known why uh, and when something was deprecated and where users should go in order to find a non-deprecated format. Let me continue giving a tour of uh, the user interface here. On the top left is where you'll find all of your files. Depending on what mini tab you have selected here, you may just see the ones that are relevant for your API, or you can drill down and see only the markdown files that you've produced. In this case, we have a welcome screen, uh, a short description of spectral, so on and so forth. Or if you look at the files tab, you can see all of the files that are in your repository and that are relevant to Stoplight. If you need to add more API assets, you just click the plus button. And with the plus button, you can go ahead and add new APIs, endpoints, models, simple markdown articles, spectral style guides, a stoplight config. This is helpful if you want to exclude something uh, from, from your repository so that it doesn't get ingested by stoplight. You can add simple images, and of course, a table of contents uh, configuration file so that you can order uh, the left-hand sidebar as you see fit. Let's go back to our API. And this drawer down here gives you a quick at-a-glance view of uh, all the aspects of your open API file. So here you can see that we have a single path defined with four verbs. In addition, we have a number of shared parameters. These parameters can be used across any of the APIs that I create. Um, if I had shared models, they would be here, but I also have these models up here. And the difference between them is the models that you would find down uh, below would be those models that are explicitly defined in your open API document. Or, uh, you know, by contrast, the models up at the top are standalone JSON schema models that you can use uh, across multiple APIs. Let's say I wanted to make a change. Let's say I wanted to add a, you know, add a new API or a new endpoint rather. Go ahead and do that. Specify what uh, API, open API file I want this recorded in. Set up a tag. Uh, in this case, I would want some kind of tag so that it is appropriately grouped with other things that are relevant to that. And then I would go ahead and specify uh, that route as well. In this case, to kind of stay with consistency, I'll use the API and then let's say maybe users, user ID and devices to fetch a specific user's devices. Find my operations. And of course I can create a lot more as well. Um, many of these HTTP verbs you'll hopefully never have to use, but they're all here in case you do. And I can go ahead and create that. If I wanted to customize the security, I could do that here, or I could edit what I've previously defined in my global security operations. I can add my headers, uh, query parameters, or even cookies. And all of these can be explicitly defined here or separately referenced if they already exist. So for example, if all my APIs have sort and limits, I can go ahead and add those query parameters very quickly with a simple reference. As you can see, my documentation gets updated appropriately. Likewise, if I need to add a JSON body uh, for the request or the response, I can go ahead and generate that from JSON if I'd like and just paste it in there. I can create it manually by having specific IDs and strings. And let's say I wanted that string for an ID to be, um, well, I did want it to be a string, but let's say I wanted it to be a UUID. I can go ahead and specify that here. If I had types, I can go ahead and specify enums here. And then I can even start curating my example here as well. I can mark things as required or not. 
and add additional descriptions here. And as you can see, uh, the preview updates accordingly as well. If I didn't want to specifically define my model here, I can go ahead and instead of uh, specifying the type as any of these options, I could simply call another reference. And this reference can reference something from this file, meaning the same open API file here would reference some of these models down here in the bottom left. I could reference any of the open API files in the entire project, which would reference any of these in the top left. Or I could even show you something in the design library. And the way this works is that I can essentially establish an entire project as a design library. And so I could have all of my JSON schema file definitions in another repository, designate that as my design library, and then all of my projects uh, could reference that design library for models, query parameters, cookies, et cetera. Last thing I'd like to show you today, obviously we're not gonna get through everything, but the other thing that I think is really cool are these uh, style guides. So I already have one here generated. If not, I could just hit the plus symbol and click style guide here. These style guides are a collection of uh, potentially custom rules, but also inherited rules, uh, depending on what open API version you're using. You can specify that when you create it and then it auto populates it with all these rules. You can further customize it by changing the uh, error uh, warning or information alarms here, or you can simply disable the rule if that's something that your organization doesn't care about. Custom rules are really interesting. These are rules that we've specified in code view. We're still working on a form editor here. And in code view, you can specify all of your rules uh, you can make things Pascal case if you'd like to, or potentially kebab case, uh, require parameter descriptions, so on and so forth. This is using an open API or an open source tool called Spectral, which provides general API uh, or YAML and JSON linting that is especially good at uh, validating open API definitions. There's a big community that can talk more about uh, spectral rules. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that have shared their spectral rule set so that you can adopt those as well if you see fit. Well, that's about all the time we have uh, for this quick, short, uh, and simple demo. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Q&A that we already have going on. Awesome. Thanks, Troy. All right. So first one I see here, sorry, I'll just, I'll just keep rolling with this, Evan, if that's okay. Go for it. Okay. Uh, do you have a good way of having open API and human created markdown files in multiple languages, for example, English and Spanish, apart from implementing services like localize? That's a really great question. Um, we do not have, uh, we do not really support localization or internationalization in a meaningful way. Um, really the only way to do that would be if you were to set up different versions of your API or entirely different projects that, uh, were in different languages. Conversely, you could potentially also spin up other workspaces. And depending on what language the user had chosen, you could send them to that workspace when they're looking for different documentation. Speaking of versioning, since I just mentioned it, that's another question as well. How do we handle API versioning? Well, if I go back here, discard my changes. This is where I would typically push up to GitHub and start the review process. I have a little version picker here. If I was logged out, you would only see what we call published versions, V1 and V2. But since I'm logged in, I have access to some of these unpublished versions as well. All of these are in fact branches. Uh, so when you create a new branch, uh, it will show up here as an unpublished version. I can go ahead and edit those branches, publish them as I see fit, and even change uh, how I call those branches uh, and I can update the display name here so that uh, third-party users who are accessing your documentation have something a little bit more intuitive than a branch name. All right, last question I see here is on the CMS, is it possible to add a custom element 
created by me or import from a library. So right now, the um, documentation itself, I assume you're talking about this content that gets created, um, not only the open API file content, but also the markdown file. We do not allow you to insert any custom JavaScript or HTML uh, into these pages. However, one thing that we are currently working on in our roadmap is to give you the ability to embed our documentation into your pages. And so if you have any custom elements, uh, you can go ahead and show those and then show our documentation uh, produced from your open API file directly in line. Since I'm talking about the roadmap, I also want to introduce you to our roadmap, roadmap.stoplot.io. Not every organization exposes their roadmap, but we do a really good job, I think, of telling you everything that's coming down the pipe uh, and telling you a little bit about the things that we've been considering. So we have an under consideration tab planned and launched. You can review here what we have going on. And by all means, either submit an idea if you have one uh, that isn't already listed or add your voice to the chorus here, mark something as important or critical and tell us why you think it is and give us some feedback. Do we have any other questions uh, before we move on? Okay, I see a question here about, do you support SOAP APIs? Um, not really is the answer to that. Um, we are really uh, focusing on getting open API specification V2, V3. Uh, we're slowly starting to support async API uh, specification and the definition of that. Uh, we have not yet uh, taken on SOAP APIs. All right, I think that's about it. Um, Evan, I'll hand it off to you now. Great, thanks everyone for joining. Oh, we have, I think we got one more question actually, Troy. Oh yeah, sure. Is there a way to dynamically create the API based on selection or options or a way to send a REST request? Um, interesting, dynamically create the API based on selection or options. So I don't think, I guess I'm having a little trouble understanding exactly what this is. You can create and send a REST request. Um, when we go here and take a look our, at our devices, the try it out mechanism does actually produce an HTTP request and can send it along, assuming that you're not using the mock server to do that. Um, I don't actually, the server is not actually up and running, so I can't show you, but it is making the API request there. Um, it does, you know, if you're using the mock server, it can create a dynamic response uh, and either return the specific examples that you have in mind uh, based on the request that was sent or send you some kind of dynamic response. Um, beyond that, we do have some code generation capabilities. If you're talking about creating either server side uh, or client side code, most of what you'll see here is going to be client side code generation for things like Python, PHP, et cetera. Um, William, if you feel like your question wasn't sufficiently answered, I'd love to, to get in touch with you guys. Um, mm -hmm. You can reach out to us at sales at stoplight.io or support. I think that's in fact the last slide that we have here as yeah, well. That's right. So, you know, Troy mentioned it already, but uh, thanks everyone for taking the time. I think that'll, that'll be it for the questions today. But if people like William have more questions for us, you can hit us up at sales at stoplight.io or support at stoplot.io, just to reemphasize that. Thanks everyone for coming today. I hope you enjoyed uh, all the stuff that Troy had to, to demo for us today and we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.